Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. Uh, my guest this week is Romney Malco. He's the guest I've been m- probably most looking forward to out of anybody because, one, he's one of the smartest guys I know, uh, healthiest guys I know, and just he's one of those guys that you feel better about yourself after talking to him. He's one of the most positive guys. He doesn't badmouth people and... I've never seen him say a bad word about anybody in my life. Well, with the exception of my stepdad. I've, I've had deep conversations with Romney about my stepdad. That's the only guy I've literally heard Romney go, man, fuck that dude. <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's the first time Romney said something bad about somebody. But I think it, it's, it's timely that Romney's on this week because he's got a movie coming out January 30th. I'm sorry, July 31st, this Friday, called Tijuana Jackson. And... I've known about Tijuana Jackson for nine years. Romney's been telling me about him. He's been putting his stuff out there on YouTube and different social media platforms. And it's always, to me, it's it's inspiring when I see somebody just like go after something they want. And he made this movie on his own, raised the money on his own, directed it, edited it, put it together. And he's now it's finally come to fruition. Because I know he, I think it was three years ago, he recorded uh, Tijuana Jackson, like the the principal photography. Obviously, you got the editing and everything else, and he had to go out and sell it and everything. But um, I think with Romney being such a positive person, last week uh, Nick Cannon was going through a lot. With um, uh, he had he had his own podcast and he had Progr- Professor Griff on, and I think the podcast was from years ago. But Nick started saying some stuff about white people, Jewish people, uh, hurtful stuff. And then MTV Viacom separated from Wild and Out. Uh, radio show, he's taking a break from that. Uh, and then Nick made an a Instagram post about killing himself, contemplating suicide and stuff. And that's what I'm, you never know what people are going through behind closed doors. And I think with Romney, Romney would be a great person for Nick to talk to uh, at what he's going through right now. Because he just has a way to put everything into perspective and to make you feel better about yourself when you're done talking to him. Like, I think that's why I'm so excited about this week's episode is because I know when we're done with this podcast, and if you're listening to this podcast, you're going to want to eat better. You're going to want to treat people better. Uh, you're just going to feel motivated about life in general. One of those people, when you get done, you're like, okay, uh, I shouldn't be eating this, or I should be eating this, or I should call that person that I haven't talked to, or maybe I was upset with somebody, but it really wasn't that big of a deal. And when I saw Nick going through everything he was going through, the first person I thought of was I was like, man, I wish, uh, I, I hope Nick has someone like Romney in his life. And then here, here's the thing. Nick's going through all his stuff. And then last week, it, this is what's crazy about social media. Before Nick got really deep into um, leaving this earth and making posts like that, uh, I, as soon as he got let go from Wild and Out, as comedians do, I made a post saying, I'm the new host of Wild and Out. I did this, I did this post, right? And I can't believe people believed it because it was being so sarcastic and it was basically poking fun at. They, you know, Nick gets replaced by a white dude, a middle-aged white dude on Wild and Out, which is not going to happen, by the way. It's ridiculous. And it was basically being sarcastic, like how, quote-unquote, they're going to replace a black guy with a white guy on a show that's clearly an urban show. Uh, so I said, my guests are going to be like the Spice Girls and NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, oh, not just in Timberlake because he cost too much money. My first guest is going to be Carrie Underwood. My DJ is going to be DJ Pauly D., It was so obvious, it was sarcasm and a joke. But when I tell you, so many people thought that was real. And if you could see some of the DMs I got on Instagram and just some of the public messages that was like, ain't nobody gonna watch that shit. Uh, You ain't funny. How dare you? Just just what, that's what they do. Another white man taking a show from a black man. I was like, do you guys believe that? I just can't believe how, and I don't call people dumb and stupid a lot, but I can't believe how dumb people are on social media. And then I had to stop making, I made another post saying I can't believe people thought it was real, 
But I had to stop and refrain myself because I was like, wait, wait a minute. I finally realized most of the people sending me the, the, the DMs or the messages on that post were teenagers. They were just kids and they just didn't know any better. And I was like, oh my God, I'm sitting here saying kids are stupid. I didn't want to be that guy. Now I'll give a pass if you're a teenager, you just don't know any better. But if you're an adult and you thought that was real, you're stupid. And I'm not saying you're, sh you're stupid in life, but you're stupid for believing that post. I'll put it that way. I just can't believe something. Then it's funny because a lot of times uh, when people do the whole white black thing with me, white man taking a black guy's job, I'll go to their page and just cause I'm, I'm bored a lot. It's COVID, you're by yourself a lot. So you look at people's pages, you get bored. And it's just people that are angry about everything or, or you gotta be careful of internet trolls. Also, you gotta be careful of that. Because the one thing I've seen on Facebook more than any other, and I saw it on both sides, and I can't believe people are falling for it. Talk about falling for things on the internet. I've seen one where it's a, it's a hateful post saying black people are about to go out and just kill and, and commit crimes against white people. I've seen posts saying, black people, we got to take this country over and we're going to do it. Then I saw the ex damn near verbatim the exact same post saying white people we're gonna go be careful there's there you know not no i'm saying white people they're about to go kill and and commit crimes against black people i was like this it was the same post it was somebody saying as black people we got to take this country over and we're gonna go handle it and start hurting white people and then i saw another one and it was like as white people, we got to defend our country and not let it get taken over. So we're going to go kill and, and hurt black people. I'm like, it's the same post. It's internet trolls playing on people's emotions and people are falling for it. And I'm like, I can't believe people are falling for this. Like, that, it's not a real post. It's not, it didn't really go out. I, I Sometimes I think um, you got to take a step back and use common sense. Like, I don't think anybody really sent this post out. It came from one person and people are going to take it serious. I don't know. It's just amazing to me. And I'm not talking about kids or young people falling for it. I'm talking about middle-aged people falling for these posts. I saw it on both sides on my Facebook. I got now on my fan page. I have, I don't have really control. Anybody can do my fan page, but on my personal page, that's people that I've approved. And I only got probably less than 2000 people on my personal page. And that's where I saw the post on both sides. And I couldn't believe people were falling for it. I was like, I saw white people that I'm friends with or acquaintances with on my Facebook page that was like, this came across my feed, be careful. And I was like, what? And then I'd see black people that I'm friends or acquaintance, acquaintances with saying, this came across my feed, be careful, there's gonna be white racists coming around looking to hurt and kill random black people. And then I seen white people post, be careful, there's gonna be black, there's black people out there that are coming after to kill and hurt just random white people. I'm like, dude, how did you guys not realize what's going on? I picked it up immediately. There was like a slight misspelling of a word. For one, if you want me to take your post serious, you gotta spell check. That's first thing in my book. If you misspell something, I'm not taking it serious. That's why I'm a terrible speller and there's a lot of grammatical errors in a lot of posts I make because half the time they're not real. I'm just, I'm just bullshitting. Hence the Nick Cannon wilding out one. So I don't know, that's my little rant on the internet today and, and where we're at in this country. Um, so with that, uh, I do hope Nick is, uh, Nick's always been cool with me. Everybody knows I, I started out and stand up and I start out with Nick down in San Diego. And, you know, when he said what he said on his podcast, I was just like, ah, I wouldn't, have, that, that was stupid, but I don't want to see his career over for it or end it. Uh, I just think if, if I'm being completely 100, I just think he had somebody, he had Professor Griff on his podcast and I think he was trying to almost agree with what his guest's saying and he got caught up in agreeing too much. And... He said some stuff he shouldn't have said. Now, I didn't want to see his show get canceled or him get canceled. I'm, I guess I'm not vindictive like that. I just think when somebody says something, you have to kind of look at their track record as a whole because I think everyone says some stupid shit sometimes. But if that's not, if they're not consistently doing it, 
Then you take, take a time, pull them aside, let them issue an apology. My bad. You learn from it and you move on. I don't think um, you just got to, we got to cancel somebody or have them lose their jobs because of it. With that, I'm glad we got one of the most positive people on the planet on this week's podcast. And I, like I said, I've been looking forward to this dude just about more than anybody since this. I'm glad we got all the other guys from Think Like a Man on already, and they all had the showerhead story. I'm not even going to ask him about the showerhead story. We all know it. Romney installed showerheads for everybody on the cast of Think Like a Man because he's scared. He was concerned about our skin, and I'm sure he's going to get into this food we should be eating that's good for our skin on this episode. You should come out of this episode, and if you take everything Romney says to heart, you should have flawless skin within six weeks. I'll put it like that. If you have any blemishes, they should be gone if you just listen to what Romney says in this next hour. All right, so with that, my guest this week is my homeboy, Romney Malco on the Get Some Podcast. I've had every cast member from Think Like Command, well, every male cast member from Think Like Command, and I wanted to wait to get this guy last because I wanted everybody else to talk about him <laughs> before he came on my podcast. He has a movie drop in this Friday called Tijuana Jackson. Now, Tijuana's been a brain, I, I, don't know, a, I don't know, a labor of love for this guy for over 10 years. If you don't know who he is from Think Like a Man, you probably know him from the MC Hammer movie back in 2001, or as white people know him as the black guy from 40 Year Old Virgin. I think, I think more people would know him, because every time I talk about Romney to my friends, they go, who is it? I go, the black guy, a 40-year-old virgin. Oh! And it's like <laughs> this whole reaction. So my guest this week is Romney Malco. Romney, what's up? Man, I'm good. What's up, Gary? Good to see you, my bruv. How are you, fam? I'm good. Where are you? Um, you're riding this out in Fort Lauderdale, right? This COVID? COVID, man. Uh, long story. I'll make it really short. We were in the Maldives enjoying our vacation. Our kids were in Puerto Rico enjoying their vacation. And the goal was for us to meet in Florida. And then this whole COVID-19 thing broke out. And bruh, uh, we had to do a mad dash back. But because all the borders were shutting down and New York had gotten hit so hard, uh, we had to fly all the way to California, rent a car, and then rush all the way down to Florida to get our kids. And we've pretty much been here ever since because we, we, we weren't able to get back across the border to, the, uh, to Canada in time. So we've been living in Florida during this whole thing, which is cool because according to the governor, it's the only state that hasn't been affected by COVID-19. Now, do you have a house in Fort Lauderdale? Uh, you know, not our, it's like rental properties. So we, we buy rental properties all over the place. And so we have a duplex that was actually under renovations and so I use one side to set up this studio and we actually live on the other side. And you know, oh. it's good cause it's got a pool and a yard so the kids are not going crazy. So it kind of pans out and we don't have to leave our house. If we want, we can have our groceries delivered, that kind of thing, it's not bad. Now I, when, when this whole lockdown happened back in mid-March, you're the first person I called cause I said, okay, Romney, what should I be eating and drinking? Because I knew you would know more than anybody how to boost your immune system. And you sent me, like, if it would have been, uh, been an email, it would have been probably a three-page email, but it was in a text <laughs> of every vitamin, every, every liquid I should be drinking, taking, some shit I never mm -hmm. heard of, chlorofluorophyll mm -hmm. or something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, and I go, damn right. because I, I always tell people, I go, if they... Redo the Dos Equis man, the most interesting man in the world. It, it's got to be you to take his place. If that guy's black, yeah. if they do like, I don't know, Colt 45 takes that. <laughs> the most interesting man in the world. It's got to be Romney. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you right now, I get asked that question so much that I've actually accumulated that list over time. And what's crazy is it's not like it's a whole bunch of stuff. Because I really, I'm very skeptical about a lot of supplements. I, I, I personally believe that food is the best medicine. The right food is the best medicine. It's just that we confuse the definition of food. So what we, what, here's what I mean by that, is that we're sometimes eating things that actually contain absolutely no nutritional benefit whatsoever, yet it's under the category of food. 
And mm -hmm. so what, what I try to do is I try to make sure that when I ask, when I say, yo, the reason that you should be eating chlorella, and then I give you this extensive breakdown of why chlorella is so important, not to mention chlorella is the first food on the world, but it's one of the few supplements that I really believe in. Vitamin D3, I really believe in. But there's not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always say, uh, when I'm asking people, you know, what should I be eating, what I should be eating, it's easier to tell me what I shouldn't eat. So if, if any listeners out there are dealing with the COVID right now, I'm asking you, Romney, I'm not, I don't want you to tell people what they should be eating. Just give us what you should not be putting in your body. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, now look, I'm no health nutritionist or nothing like that. I'm just Shit. telling you how I get down. And like Shit. when you're in a situation where you're forced to sit still for so long and actually deal with stuff and actually be in the face of your kids and your family all day, every day, you don't have all the stimulants that you're used to and the constant going to distract you. It's very easy to start eating comfort foods to supplement the endorphin rushes you'd normally be getting through the activities of your, of your everyday routine. And so, in my personal opinion, I would avoid things like, look, drinking more than, you know, eight ounces of, 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 of any fruit juice in one sitting. Um, I'd probably only do that, if you did that at all, I'd only do it once a day. I wouldn't eat, I wouldn't make eating bread a routine. Um, because, it, you know, the minute you masticate it, it, it converts to sugar, it gives you these endorphin rushes, but then it also kind of like, isn't Hold the on. best thing for you to be putting in your body. What's up? What, what word did you say, emaphricate it? No, you know, the, the minute you masticate, um, uh, masticate bread, like the minute you chew it and break it down. Did I use the right word? Damn, you got me I don't know, I've never heard that now. word before in my life. Let, let, me, let me look it up now. <laughs> <laughs> did you say emaphricate it? <laughs> no, the minute you Africanize, yeah. The minute you masticate, the minute you masticate yeah, it's like to grind, so to crush. Eat. The minute you masticate it, it, con it converts to sugar. Like chips and breads and shit like that. That shit ain't, it's not, it's not really food. You know what I mean? And mm. so th those would be my recommendations right there. It's just to kind of avoid bread, rice, pasta, sugar. Really, really small portions of that stuff. And if, if, you, if you think about it, if you're eating food and the food is making you sleepy, you probably didn't really eat food. Because food is supposed to energize. It's not supposed to put your ass into the itis, right? You're supposed to have the itis after you eat. Yeah. And so, you know, my whole thing is, is that sugar is, is such an... It, it, people, we really underestimate how addictive it is, and we really underestimate how much it messes us up, how much it ages us. There's actually an acronym for sugar, because what happens is, I know I'm going to get long-winded, forgive me, y'all. By the way, my movie is called Tijuana Jackson, Purpose Over Prison. It stars me, Regina Hall, Tammy Roman. Um, but I gotta tell you that a lot of us don't understand when you eat sugar, sugar actually, um, your, your cells become resistant because of the fact that the sugar creates these insulin spikes and your cells don't wanna be poisoned by it. So your cells stop, they shut down. They, they don't open up and allow any nutrients in, they stop altogether. And as a result of that, the sugar sits in your system for a while and eventually begins to float and attach its cells, itself to the outer walls of your cells. And believe it or not, as, it's, as the sugar continues to leach, it begins to like remove the elasticity from your cells. And that's how you age prematurely. Just want to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. That's why Romney is 75 years old. A lot of you don't know that. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Your boy, your boy was born, I'm, I'm 75. I was born in 19, yeah. <laughs> 1935. Yeah, Romney's first gig was opened up for Frank Sinatra. A lot of people don't know that. He used to open up for the Rat yeah. Pack in Vegas. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, so, but I'm up there, man. I'm 52 yeah, it, years old, and I don't think I've said this on any show yet. I'm 52 years old and about to have my first biological child. Wow. Wow. Yeah, well, I didn't I'm even 51. know that. I didn't I, know I'm that. I know. I want to drop it. I saved it for you, fam. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's us. I'm, I'm, Dude, I'm, I'm 51. Oh, listen, think, okay, we got the COVID going on, but what you just told me, Think about where you're at in your life, right? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. got your, I think Tijuana Jackson, you, you've done a lot of stuff in your past, but I think this was the labor of love that you've always wanted to do. And you're having a kid. Outside of COVID, right now, I don't think it gets much better than being you. I don't, you know, look, I, I'm gonna tell you straight up, this 
to me is, is crazy synchronicity. Um, I'm gonna start with COVID because I don't know what white guilt feels like, but- It's awful. I'm, I'm wondering if it feels anything like <laughs> the fact that me and my family are doing well, people that I know such as yourself are doing well, and then just up the street, people are suffering, losing family members, and don't know how to feed family members in, in the midst of COVID-19. That's got, for me, that's like the biggest mindfuck I've had in a minute, you know? Um, I, don't, I, I don't know, I don't know how to feel other than uh, guilty. I don't feel like I can even give enough. The other side of that is that COVID-19 has created the perfect uh, setting for Tijuana Jackson. And what I mean by that is when I was filming the movie, when I was writing the movie, when I was editing the movie, I was telling people, I was like, listen, I don't know if folks are gonna wanna sit in a theater and watch this, cause you ain't gonna be able to laugh honestly and not feel a kind of way about whether or not you're being judged by the person sitting next to you or behind you for laughing at some of the stuff that's being said in that movie, right? You know, you know how TJ talks, he got that line, he'd be like, we got this thing in prison called a peekaboo. You know what a peekaboo is, right? Peekaboo. No. Peekaboo. Okay, everybody in the audience, if you don't know what a peekaboo is, raise your hand. Shit, y'all, bunch of fucking squares. A peekaboo, what it is, is when you, it's this thing we got, we do in prison, and when you really want to humiliate a motherfucker, you push your dick between your legs, and they can blow you from the back. This one, when you come, you can shit in his face. Wow. Right? <laughs> Adam, I've, I've never heard of the peekaboo. <laughs> right. And, yo, the whole movie is like that. Me and Regina and Tammy Roman are frigging, it's, we're, it's ridiculous and, 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 very, and played very real. And so I was always concerned about if this were to go to theaters, people might not be comfortable laughing in, in, in public to that. And because of the fact that COVID-19 has kind of stripped away all the theatrical viewings, it's made, this, it's made it better for my movie, which is horrible to say. And, no. Listen, you know, I, I relate yeah. <clears throat> this way. You know, I, you've told me a lot of Tijuana Jackson sayings over the years. In fact, we, we used Tijuana Jackson at one, my special, I agree with myself, back in 2013, we recorded it, where we oh. was in a coffee shop. And we, what I loved about it, we didn't have a script. I was just like, when you flew in, and you did me a solid, you didn't ask for anything, you just said, hey, I, yeah, what time do I gotta be there? And I'll fly in, and we shot it. I didn't want to write anything out or have anything because I just wanted to, to ad-lib the whole scene and get the raw Tijuana Jackson and how maybe I'd react in a coffee shop when we shot it. But I think but it's I timely it anyway. because- I wrote it any fucking way. <laughs> oh, you ended up writing it down? <laughs> I, 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 wrote, I wrote a whole script. <laughs> oh yeah, you ended up writing a whole script. But well, yeah, I think- yeah. Like we're in such a cancel culture nowadays where you got people coming into stand-up comedy shows with their cell phones and they'll, they'll record something and put it on YouTube and then as a comedian, we're working something out and then you got this group that's just offended by it and you're mm. like, no, when you do stand-up and you're in comedy clubs, it's rare you get people walking out or offended by jokes and you almost enjoy the reaction when they go, oh, like I can't believe you said that, that dark humor. I think that's why people go to comedy clubs. So what I, I'm excited to see at Tijuana Jackson this Friday because I know there's going to be at least 10 moments during this movie where I'm going to be like, oh, shit, Romney went there. <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be. I mean, it wouldn't, you know, that's so funny. I remember years ago, you and me having this, this conversation, and I was telling you, like, yo, I, I've actually started figuring out how to work out jokes via the internet and a chat room. And, um, and you were like, you know what, man, I need a live audience. And I understood that too, you know, that there's an, there's an energetic reciprocity that's occurring when you're standing on stage in front of your audience or trying to figure out an audience. And you can't do that online. You don't get to make that eye contact. You don't get to feel that energy. I respect that. And also like knowing the city really counts too. And Mm -hmm. But I, I was really starting, I started figuring out how to use the internet with his live stream show that I was doing years ago to figure out what jokes worked, what jokes didn't. And, you know, there were some tried and trues that actually, uh, you know, lasted the test of time and ended up in the movie, man. 
but the blessing of the uh, the blessing of this whole situation that we're in right now, especially with George Floyd and Rashard Brooks and everything that's going on, is that when I look at those brothers, I see TJ. I saw that video of Rashard Brooks. Uh, uh, rest in peace, my brother. Um, where he was just talking about, yeah, you know, I've made some bad, so, so some some bad decisions, but it, you know, that don't mean I'm an animal. I'm I'm getting it together, and I think people should be should be considerate of that. And it's like, damn, this sounds like right out of the Tijuana Jackson script, which is kind of the point of the whole damn script, which kind of you know explains how when you're coming out of of, of prison, it's not just that the system tries to disenfranchise you even further to a third class or fourth class citizen. But believe it or not, me growing up in the hood, I always ended up hanging out with the dudes who just got out of jail because I really felt for them. Because their families wouldn't try to fuck with them either. You know what I mean? Their homies, their mm -hmm. friends wouldn't try to fuck with them either. So I ended up being the dude that would go on these double dates that I shouldn't have been on. I ended up being the dude that would do, you know, that, that be driving this dude around to places I shouldn't be, that type of shit. And I just learned an empathy that I wouldn't have probably had otherwise, but as a result of that, it gave me this character, Tijuana Jackson. I used Tijuana Jackson to talk to kids. That's what I used it for. When I say kids, I'm talking about young adults. I used it to talk to them and help them understand things about themselves that no mentor is coming into their lives and explaining. And that's how the whole shit took off. That's who financed the film, those kids. Yeah, because you would I, explain to people out there that aren't in business, you did a Kickstarter that's how you got the movie funded, right? Yeah, I didn't do Kickstarter because of oh, you, you didn't. Know, I'm sorry. I look, you know, I, I did Indiegogo, but the reason I chose not to do Kickstarter was because there were a few things in regards to Kickstarter's reputation that I wasn't really sure about. I didn't know what to believe, what not to believe, and so just to avoid the possibilities of actually comp competing with major corporations for dollars, I chose to go on the Indiegogo platform, and um, I did. I, I started a. To, I was living in Puerto Rico, and towards the end of 2016, I started a, a crowdfunding campaign, hardest thing I've ever done. And that crowdfunding campaign was used to attract investors. So I, what I was doing was, ideas, everybody in Hollywood got a damn idea. Proof of concept is what wins. And so if I could show investors that there was an audience willing to put money, maybe even upwards of $100,000, collectively into this project, that would incentivize investors to be like, okay, there's a built-in audience out there, we can do this. And that's basically what I did. And you went that route because, okay, so you, the script's already written, right? So you got this script, Tijuana Jackson, it's done. And then you're like, I wanna raise money independently because you wanted to have complete control of the movie, right? You didn't want somebody coming in saying, edit this out, take this out, that's offensive. Am I, am I, am I correct in that? You're kind of correct in that um, because that was, look, that was the dream, right? But what, what, what also happens is, is that th th there's this, this conditioning that has led me to believe that to get a movie made, you need Hollywood's approval, you need backing. I had this, I was under this false, this, this real uh, false belief that I had connections in Hollywood and that I could go to producers and producers who were t screaming about Tijuana Jackson online were going to back this uh, project. I had a manager who was telling me he's gonna raise the money for me within, within a year or two. I had other producers that reading the script telling me how genius it was and like, hey, you need to change things and do this. And I'm like, yeah, well, sh should we be checking into the financing? And the long and the short of it is, is that uh, none of that stuff panned out. A lot of it was just wolf tickets. In fact, all of it was wolf tickets. And so, while living in Puerto Rico, um, I just had this revelation where I was like, all you really need to make a movie is money and you can hire a crew. And so the first thing that came to mind was to run this crowdfunding campaign. My manager did, uh, tried to discourage me from doing it. And here's what he said. He said, I don't know if it's a good look for you, man. I don't think it's a good look. I said, why not? He goes, well, you're an established actor and an established actor asking fans for money I just don't think it's, I, I just don't think it's a good look. I don't think, and I have to stop him. I was like, whoa, hold up now, what, wait. You think I'm an established actor? Well, shouldn't an established actor be able to raise a little bit of money to make a movie? The average movie in Hollywood is made, the average comedy in Hollywood is made for 10 to $20 million. I'm like, you telling me that we couldn't raise 400,000 and I'm an established actor? I was like, I don't know 
if you mean black established, what kind of established you mean, but established has not translated in the, in the ways that I needed to. So as a result of that, I, I, I got to do what I got to do. That was the beginning of me being like, I'm really going to do this my way. I'm not going to answer to anyone. And I, and all, listen, I'm telling you right now, listen, I love Eddie Murphy. And this is not a diss to Eddie Murphy. Um, I love so many, so many comedians have influenced me growing up. But there's a transition that usually occurs where they kind of start off becoming famous because of these, uh, uh, these opinions that they have. It's not a matter of whether they're right or wrong, but it's how committed they are to these opinions and their delivery and the conviction in which they tell these things. And then they become a bit more educated and then they eventually uh, or, 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 or insightful and more conscious and their audience begins to expand. And then as, as their audience expands and the, 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 the deals start coming in, they begin to homogenize themselves, right? And so Eddie Murphy was one of those dudes <laughs> that went from delirious to raw, and I felt like he didn't skip a beat. And I was like, whatever the hell that is right there, to me, that's the sweet spot. And I wanna stay there with my entertainment. Don't get me wrong, I'll go do a million little things. Um, don't get me wrong, I'll gladly go do a family movie. But if I'm writing and directing and producing, I wanna be in that sweet spot. I wanna be yeah. in that Eddie Murphy sweet spot. And so th that was the beginning of me saying, I'm making, I'm gonna start doing things and I'm gonna start doing them this way a lot. And I, I was intentional about, I needed to hire a star, um, hence Regina Hall, uh, and some star power. I got Regina Hall, I got Tammy Roman. And the reason I needed to hire these ladies was because that really helps incentivize investors, right? Mm -hmm. And when you have that caliber of talent, uh, myself, Regina Hall, Tammy Roman, and the budget that I was pitching that I would make the movie at, which was under $400,000, uh, is kind of a no-brainer that the, the possibilities of recouping are fairly, you know, certain. And that, that's all investors and angel investors and, and, and fu hedge fund managers want to do is mitigate risk. So I started the crowdfunding campaign, but not before telling investors that I was starting the crowdfunding campaign. Right, and then uh, I had their retention while I was uh, raising the money. And as the crowdfunding campaign began to grow, I kept looking to my investors like, yeah, it's kind of, yep, we, we hit 30% mark in four days. Damn, woo, it's gonna be a hot one. And ended up, and you never ask for what you want. If you want 100,000, ask for 50,000. If you want 50,000, ask for 25,000. And the reason is because a successful crowdfunding campaign uh, usually is funded between 200 and 1,000 percent of asking. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm a little long-winded, but no, uh, I, yeah, that, I completely expected that this uh, podcast. <laughs> 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 I told, I told, when I had Jerry on, I had Ely on and Terrence on. I all said, uh, "Boy, when Romney comes on, I might need a three-hour pocket." Because <laughs> 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 when he gets going, I just fall back and listen. Because you always say yeah. you don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. And I go, with Romney, if Romney's in the room, I always know I'm not. So I'm good with him in the room. <laughs> Laz, stop, dude. Yo, so let me, um, let, let me yeah. ask you, when you say you got Regina and Tammy Roman, so you had them commit to the movie before you had funding? No. So I had them commit to the movie, um, like, I had Regina commit to the movie before funding was complete. I got Tammy Roman afterwards, but you start with a certain budget, right? And so I think my budget when I first started was like about $200,000, maybe even $180,000. And then um, with that, I was able to start the party. So my manager who, who was discouraging me from it, when, the, when he saw me actually raising the money, he said, you know what? This is a lesson for me. And you know what, Romney? I think you're right. Sometimes you got to start the party. His words, I use this quote all the time now. Sometimes you got to start the party, put on the music, start the party, pour your own drink, and then send out the invitations. And that's basically what happened. So now I had Regina Hall uh, saying that she was willing to do a movie if I could get the funding. Um, and I had $180,000 and I actually was casting. And that process attracted more investors. But by the time we had gotten to that point, I had one investor who was 
pretty much 100% in and like actually rounding up the number that I was asking for. Almost like he couldn't believe I could make a movie for that much. And, um, and then I had like four investors waiting in line. So I packaged it with, 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 with Miss Hall and then started the party, put on the music. And by putting on the music, I then was able to acquire additional talent, recognizable talent. And then that uh, confirmed or, or, or solidified my additional investors. So was the, well, it's obviously not going to be in theaters now. And you said earlier, you're glad it's not. It, yeah, yeah. It is, it is in some theaters. It is in some theaters. Was, was that... When you were shooting it, was you thinking, I hope, I hope it gets to theaters or Netflix or what was in a perfect world when, without the COVID, where did you want it to be like distributed at? Let's go on to the next question. That's the answer right there. I'm trying not to be long-winded right there. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. I always was like, this is a pocket movie. <laughs> it's a pocket movie. I made this to be distributed digitally on a phone, sitting in the bathroom, which is, by the way, I just got to give love to, uh, to, to Gabrielle Union right now for she did a Tijuana Jackson testimonial where she talked about how her and D-Wade sitting there and she's saying how she had this issue. They had a rough patch when she would always interrupt him when he was in the bathroom, always had something to say. Yo, you know how real life that is? Like, as she, as she said in, in, in the video, a man's toilet time, especially when he has kids, that's all he got. That's Facts. all he got. Facts. And so my, my goal was I was going to make a movie that you could go and watch while you was on the toilet. Because you don't want your kids hearing this shit. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? You don't want your uh, kids talking about this. Hey, Yo. Rami, I can't wait because, you know, my son's 19 now. Austin, I can't wait to watch this movie with him. Because we <laughs> both, I'm just, I just think, I, like, I think funny's funny. There's no off limits with me as a comedian. And the fact that my son likes the, the darkest shit out there when I see him watching what he's laughing at, I can't wait to watch this with him. <laughs> oh, God. God. Can, I, I, high I, five. I want, give me five minutes of reaction video. <laughs> All done. I'm home this weekend. So we're going we're gonna to watch it Friday as soon as it comes out. And then I'll make sure I got a, a, a camera set up so we, we can get our reaction, me and him. And then That's going to be funny. My wife might leave the room. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, but let her know it's all love. Let her know yeah. it's all love. Now, okay, mm. so you, what's crazy is like when I met you on, when we really got to know each other on Think Like a Man, I didn't realize how much like we had in common. Like we're both ex-military, both. I, I mean, you had a life way before entertainment. You had a full, I mean, I, I'm sorry, before acting. You were in a rap group, had a hit song. How many hit songs do you have? One or two? I, I'm like, a, I'm like a, I think I'm a two-hit wonder, but I really call myself a one-hit wonder because only one song really went to number one. R so remind people what one that song wonder. was. Uh, Victim of the Ghetto, College Vic Boys, Victim of the Ghetto. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it like I'm proud of it. Don't, 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 don't YouTube the shit. But listen, if you see, uh, wasn't it First Think Like a Man? We put a picture of your rap group on the wall in Terrence's room, remember? And I they, was so tired, I could not control my laughter, yes. <laughs> and then they splice like the producers and directors' heads in. They put <laughs> James and Will. Yeah, James Lopez and Will Packer. Didn't they have Tim that in there too? Yeah. <laughs> the director Tim Story. So if you go, yeah, listen, man. if you guys watch Think Like a Man, go back and watch it. And then pause it when we all are in Terrence J's room and we're confronting him about everything. And that's where Kevin walked in and said, Miss Loretta for the rest of the tour. At some point, the camera pans by the wall and you see Romney's rap group and they splice the producers and directors heads into the rap group. And we didn't tell Romney at all we was going to do it. And Dude. then um, and then you were in the Marines, too, right? I was in Marines. I was a Marine. Corps. What years yeah. were you in the Marines? 87 to 91. Yep. And, and had such a similar situation to you in which I was like, yo, I have a chance to get a record deal in California. And I was stationed in Texas as a reserve. And they were like, yo, we, go, we got a base uh, off, of a, off of Stadium Way in California. We're going to send you there. We shared that base with the Air Force, went to that base, was there for maybe a year and then told them uh, my record deal was solidified and I'm about to go on tour. And they were like, 
well, you know, you do have an obligation. I was like, yeah, but I got to go on tour. And they, they were like, okay. So the military actually supported me, at, you know, in, 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 in my, uh, my hip hop career. Did you see yourself being a lifer before, before the record deal in the Marines? No, 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 no. I, I, I look, um, there's this period where, you know, the United States, man, they just got you thinking that you got to be in college. Otherwise, you, you're going nowhere fast in, in the world. I never really bought into that, but I honestly didn't feel secure enough uh, in my dreams to be, you know, in hip hop and to be in entertainment to just go balls to the wall. So the military was kind of like, really, it was filling the gap between the ages of 18 and 20, uh, 22 to figure out what I was really going to do with my life. That's where we, and, when we talked, we were right on the same page. Because yeah. um, when I joined the Navy, it was pretty much my thinking was, I didn't know where I wanted to go. I just know where I didn't want to be. Right. So the military was a way for me to just be like, okay, I can get a fresh start in a new city. I don't care where it's mm -hmm. at on this earth, but I could just, <laughs> I could get a, if, and then I was like, I'll figure it out when I'm in the, I know that sounds odd, but you're just kind of, I think a lot of guys like that. They join the military yeah. just to figure out what they want to do with their lives. It, it's true. And when you're younger, sometimes you're just not as, you're not as aware of who actually mobilizes your military, what missions your military is actually calling out, what those obligations lend to. You're not as conscious of all that stuff. So, you know, it doesn't feel as, as big as uh, uh, an obligation as it actually pans out to be, man. You know, I, I'm sure, I don't know if you've been on any of these USO tours over to Afghanistan, but now when I go there and see these 90, these 20 year olds who've only had one boyfriend or one girlfriend in their life over there manning killing machines, it, it's hard to leave them there. It, it makes me feel like we need to switch places. Like I've lived enough life, go live some life, Let leave me here. It's, it, it's hard to leave. And so I, I guess I look at it differently now, but at the time it made all the sense in the world. And the truth is, our uh, military recruiters were incredibly seductive back in the day. They knew how to alert. They knew how to Shit. lure my dumb ass in and get me to sign up, you know, uh, blindly. Let me let me tell you, uh, my military recruiting story was my military recruiter in the Navy who got me, you know, saw 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 an easy fish and threw that line out there and <laughs> reeled me in. But I went back probably three, four years later. Uh, I don't know if the Marines had this. We, we would go work for the recruiting station for two weeks in our hometown, but it didn't count against our leave, our vacation time. Did you have that in the Marines? Oh, no. Didn't have that. Oh, so we had that where you could go back for two weeks, work for your recruiter, so you're still working, but you're back in your hometown, and it doesn't count against your, I think we had two weeks of leave a year. We were able to go home for two weeks. But my recruiter walks in to get his like W-2 and his tax papers, his forms, and he walks in, and I go, what's up, man? Now, I'm like three years in the Navy. What's going on? He goes, hey, what's up? I go, what's up? Are you, are you still in? He goes, nah, I got tired of this shit. I went, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like, what the fuck, you recruited me. <laughs> nah, man, I got tired of this shit. And he just looked bad. He looked yeah. bad. He, he was eating everything you said not to eat, Romney. He just yeah, looked yeah. like he had a sugar sandwich. On Dude. with white rice. <laughs> Man, I swear to you, I had a sergeant who should have easily been at that time in his life a gunny sergeant at least. And we did a camp. We went to Camp O'Reilly, which is in Oregon. We did like two weeks out there. We were doing all these drills and um, sleeping in the woods and hiking and whatnot. And this dude got discharged because he attacked, they were playing a prank on him. It was raining really bad and it was raining so bad we ended up all having to sleep in a cafeteria. If you, if you left the cafeteria, there's like a little gift shop down a hill, but you'd have to go in the rain and he'd go down that hill and he'd go get in these cookies. And he'd bring the cookies back and then he'd want to take off his boots and everything and dry off and while he was doing that, somebody stole his cookies. This dude threw a fit. Who stole my damn cookies? Went back down the hill to get more of that sugar, because you know it's addictive as hell. Comes back up, and somebody steals the next pack of cookies that he bought, yo. And he threw a, a fit and ended up being discharged. But he looks the way you describe your recruiter. <laughs> like, yo, like he had just had one too many bar visits. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. One too many, one too many cookies, and just miserable. 
miserable. Yeah. And here's the thing, man. I've met some really brilliant people in the military, but I've also met some people that are, well, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> That's all I'm well, saying. Well, you know, I remember sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean one night with like four, I, I used to love working nights because nobody bothered you at night. Right, Whether right. I was on shore duty or on a ship, I loved working nights. There was like four or five of us guys were sitting around, it's called mid rats. So that's what your, that's your dinner at three in the morning. And it's basically the leftovers from the dinner, you know, in the cafeteria on the ship and uh, mm -hmm. the galley. And then uh, mm -hmm. we're all sitting around and somebody goes, hey, what would you do if you had a million dollars? And every guy walk around, you know, I, I'd tell the Navy, fuck off. And I do this, I do this. And I literally looked at all the guys and I go, I'm going to make a million dollars. <laughs> and they looked at me like, man, Owen, shut up. I go, no, no, I'm going to be a comedian. I'm going to make a million dollars. And I was dead set. And like, three of the guys laughed at me, but one guy, and I remember his name, it was Whitkey, W-I-T-T-K-E. He goes, I can see that, Owen. You're funny. I'll never forget the one guy looked at me. I was like, I can see that. But the other three guys was like, it was like a million dollars was so far out of their yeah. thinking. But she also got to realize, I didn't realize until I watched uh, that documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11, that yeah. a lot of the, the enlisted military are the bottom, like the bottom of the bottom when it comes to how they were raised. It's, yeah. it's the ghetto, it's the trailer parks. It's those people with no money, they enlist because they feel like that's their only outlet. It's, so it's their, their thinking outlet. is they'll never make a million dollars. And I remember thinking, oh no, I'm, I'm gonna make a million dollars as a stand-up. Right. You know, that, that's mad funny. I was battle rapping in the military so much that there was a guy, um, we, we, I don't remember his, his full name because we, you know, we called each other by our last names. His, his last name was King. This dude would go to other barracks and be like, yo, I got this cat over at my barracks that'd smash all y'all. Every last, he'd kill, he'd kill any one of y'all on the mic. Now, back then we would say MC. And this dude would instigate battles. I'd be waking up at two o'clock in the morning, dudes had come over from their barracks to battle me. <laughs> like, what the, what the hell is going on? And so I kind of had like the opposite effect where everybody in my barracks knew that I was gonna be in show business. Probably yeah. more than me. Yeah, man. Well, I had, you know, I had a lot of support from a lot of my military buddies because when I first started mm -hmm. out in San Diego, they were the ones supporting me. And it's, it's crazy because you being the Marines, me being the Navy, you always got those guys like you go to the you go to the gym and there'd be guys like 360 Duncan and throwing it down. You're like, how is this guy in the military? Why is he not in a, at a D1 college right now? Or you go to a you go to the weight room and you see guys just putting up like 500 pounds. You're like, why is he not in a strongman contest? Or yeah. you meet guys like if I was to see yourself, I'd be like, yo, how is this guy not have a record deal? And I think mm -hmm. so by us telling what we just told, I think. There's a lot of guys out there that just joined the military because there's no other outlet. They're like, I don't know what to do. I'll figure it out. I remember yeah. being on some of those base basketball teams like, what? We got a D1 team here. <laughs> Yo, man, man, I know dudes that boxed in the military. They, Box, they yeah. Really, really should have been champ. You know, I'm going to just say, like, man, we, I, I feel like we grew up fairly similar, right? In the sense that, like... Whew. We've lived in trailer parks and whatnot, but I don't feel at the same time that we were like uh, poor. You know what I'm saying? I don't consider it poor. Like I've seen poor. I've seen third world poor. I've seen third world poor in the United States of America. There's been times when I was thinking about buying like section eight buildings and stuff like that. And when I went and saw how people were living, I just wanted to help. I didn't want to do nothing else. I was like, oh, this is, this feels like a call to action. You know, I, I can't even explain it. And so my, my, my point being is that I kind of feel as though when, when your dreams are something that seem so in, seem intangible, like making a million dollars, as you, as you put it, it's not just the people in the military, but sometimes it's our parents, sometimes it's our siblings, sometimes it's our closest friends. It's, it just seems so far-fetched to them based on the conditioning of their upbringing. You get what I'm saying? And so yeah. my blessing, which is very odd, especially being the son of immigrants, the first American born in my family, anybody I know who's first American born in their family and live in the United States of America, they had three options. They had four options. They could be a doctor, they could be a lawyer, or they could be an engineer. And 
The family wouldn't disown you, but they would settle for a dentist. Facts. Settle. Outside of that, get out the house. And my family was so encouraging of me when it came to entertainment. <clears throat> Probably because it was something that they both aspired to. My mother was a model, and that's how she came to the United States in the first place. She won a competition at Butter here. But my point being is that that little bit of encouragement in those formative years goes a long way in the same way that that little bit of discouragement goes a long way. In fact, the discouragement goes a longer way. And so that's part of it. And so if you have any, any sense, any little bit of community that's giving you like some props or telling you you can do it, um, it, it can sometimes be the deciding factor. And when you're living in, 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 in environments where people, your parents or your, your, your people are so afraid of you ending up stuck or ending up not happening, they want you to, to, uh, to aspire to tangible goals. And they're not doing it necessarily because they're hating. They're doing it sometimes because they care about you. And that seems the safest option to them. But mm -hmm. today, knowing what I know, knowing the overall big picture, you know, my kids are like, you know, concerned about whether or not they have drive um, or whether, wh whether or not they have drive or whether or not they are, you know, uh, as hardworking as they should be. I'm like, yo, if you figure out how to be happy, just figure out how to be happy. If Fact. you do that, you beat most of us. You beat 90% of the planet. You know what I'm saying? Be happy. You know, I think that if, if your calling is comedy and you're not doing comedy, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing. You're not necessarily feeling fulfilled. You know what I mean? You're not using your voice. And so anyway, that's just my opinion. Well, especially with, with comedians, I would say it, you know, the, the politically correct answer is it's, it's family, then faith, then stand up, and I, I, my wife knows this. I go, I'm a terrible husband. I'm a terrible father. I'm a miserable human being if it wasn't for stand up. I mean, like, I know that's not you're not supposed to say first, but stand up has always been that's 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 my first love from jump. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. nothing without. And the fact that you was talking about encouragement and discouragement, and how you're conditioned, how you're going up. Now you. We've had deep conversations. I don't want to get into that about my dysfunctional family. Some uh, of my favorite conversations is about your stepdad, bro. I hope he ain't listening right now, but... Oh, he will. Dude, he listens to everything. I guarantee it. <laughs> yo, bro. I, hey, I'm not even kidding, yo. I fucked up a rib listening to this shit. I fucked up a rib recalling the shit and laughing about it. Like, you said you don't want to get into it? my favorite shit when you be telling them stories day 39 of quarantine yeah. <laughs> and you break out yo he he steals the show every time fam there's it's nothing well, like it i bet i've been begging just everybody who's watching i've been begging this dude to do a whole stand-up about his stepdad but i understand you got to honor family you don't no, want to offend anyone not anymore <laughs> nah they oh, no. i haven't talked i haven't talked to my mom in over four years and my stepdad the same uh, I don't want to get too dark, but you know, ever since my brother passed away, everything kind of really fell to shit after that. Um, the family really fell apart. But um, growing up with my mom, I'll never forget, she said something to me and I said, I don't want to live like that. Was I said, I, one day I just was, saw her, I said, hey mom, how's it going? And she goes, you know, just living paycheck to paycheck like everyone else. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to live like that. But... That's her surroundings. That's everybody she's around is living paycheck to paycheck. And I remember thinking, I do not want to live like that. I do not want to have friends that are just like, um, not, I got friends that live like that, but I don't want to be like, that's our mentality is we're living paycheck to paycheck. How did you know you had a choice? I was lucky. I don't have that upbringing where it's like, um, my dysfunction and my negativity was at home, but I chose the right friends that I grew up with. I chose the right crowd to roll with in high school. Uh, mm. And I saw two parent homes and I saw people that were happy and I saw people that was like, how's your day going? And I was like, oh, that's what I want. And everybody I grew up with as far as my high school, I think that's why I give back so much to my high school was my coaches, my teachers and the kids I grew up with, they was always the ones going, man, you're funny, Gary. You're funny. And that's when like, Def Jam came out and Martin was on TV and, and all that. And they was like, Gary, you could do that. You're just as funny as them. Yeah, like guys went to high school coach, would tell me that. A, 
Right. What's the what's what's your what's your coach's name? Uh, Coach Mel Edwards and Coach Doug Krause and Coach Jay right. Fry. Okay. Those three. Because yeah. I, I told the story of how, um, and I did I did on my TV show too when I had my reality show how I was in tenth grade and I skipped going to football practice two days and we had railroad tracks that ran behind my high school and I was walking home to to the trailer park and I just didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I know it was bad at home. I hadn't hit puberty yet. All my friends were like, now they're getting girls. I'm behind. It was just, you know, you're, you're 14, 15. You're at a weird age. Your brain is telling you weird things, and you don't see any hope or any outlet. You're like, God dang, I'm just, I'm just nothing right now. And there was, a, you know, I was waiting for a train to come. And I said, God, if a train comes, I can just hop on it and get out of here. I'll just get on the train and take off. I watched too many movies thinking it was easy to jump on a train. <laughs> and then the, the, you know, then the thought came, well, maybe if I got hit by the train, then everybody would notice me. Then everybody would be like, oh, we've messed up and we feel sorry for Gary. Not saying I was contemplating suicide, but the thought came in my head. And then Thursday, I'll never, Tuesday, Wednesday, I didn't show up for practice. Thursday came. And my head coach was the librarian at the school, which is funny in itself. He was the librarian. <laughs> Yo, but he pulled me I aside. He got me who was the coach. He got me, yeah, he got me out of class and literally pulled me out of class and got me in the hallway. I'll never forget his hands like this. And he goes, where you been the past two days? And I was like, oh, I made us some excuse. He goes, all right, do you still want to be on the team? He goes, because we need you. We need you. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, I didn't, the team didn't need me. I was like 5'5", five, five, 130 pounds, <laughs> running like a 5'2", 240. But the fact that he said they needed me was all I needed from that point on. I never missed another football practice. You, and I wasn't a good football player at all, but I was going to be on the team my junior and senior year regardless, just because I felt okay. like that was the first time somebody said they needed me at, at, at that point in my life. I'll never forget that as long as I live. You're just sitting there. Where you been? That's so deep. That's I so need bra. you. We need I, you. I, I, I feel like that coach got it. I feel like he spotted it and got it. I really do. What powerful, what a powerful thing to say to a kid, you know? You know, and so all the parents that are listening out there and maybe I'm preaching what I most need to learn here, but one thing I've learned from my upbringing, seeing the contrast between like my trajectory versus the trajectory of friends of mine who I always looked at as being more talented, more capable, is, you know, Gary made a great point, which is that the school, the, the, there was a culture at the school. You've heard of corporate culture and you've heard of like, you know, company culture. There was a culture at the school that gave him something to aspire to that was different from the culture at home. And I think it's important that, you know, we as parents do our best to create a culture at home you know, that promotes us, us, uh, psychological health, emotional health. <clears throat> and that coach being like, yo, we need you. You know something? It's like right now talking to you, it's making me realize that I need to make my kids feel more needed. And we, you know, we love on our kids and maybe even to a degree spoil our kids. But I don't know if we make them feel needed as if like, you know, you are a significant team member that <clears throat> we rely on and appreciate when you show up. And I think that that's a huge part, in, as a very important part of culture and a very important part of leadership. And I just want to point that out, bro, because I think that shit is hot. Yeah. I, and, I, you know, for me, growing up, and, I, and it, it's important with your kids, I love it when I can see my kids' personality with me in the room. That means they're not like holding back. Like I like nice. seeing my daughter doing little TikTok videos and I'm right there in the background and I might get in on them and she'll laugh I'm like, dad, but she doesn't mind me being there. I'm like, okay, she's so free. She can come in the living room and just make a video and not worry that I'm sitting there because I'm not going to be like, what are you doing? And that's stupid. And what's this dumbass music you're listening to? I just like it. And I, or, or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be in the background and I kind of like being the middle aged old dad. Be like, okay, okay, NBA young boy, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, I came into my daughter's life when she was 11 years old, and sadly, she doesn't have uh, that relationship with her mom. 
for me. Like she's it, it, she's evolved a lot since you know over the last six years, but <clears throat> she's 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 different in that way. And um, you know, the, when the mom reflects, uh, the 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 mom explains that having her so young, uh, she explains that having her so young, she was you know, triggered by so many things that she kind of feel like she shut down that aspect of her child. And yeah, I think it's important that we talk about that. What you're saying right now is a huge accomplishment. It's a very huge accomplishment because I don't know if any of us are aware of it, but when we're younger, man, we just kind of like, we don't realize it, but we're busy trying to change the world so that we don't have to change ourselves. So there's all this conditioning that's, that's happening as we're growing up. And to avoid feeling that vulnerability and avoid feeling that pain, we kind of flinch at anything that has any similarities to that. So when those triggers occur, we try to shut it down rather than try to understand why we're being triggered. And unfortunately, for a lot of people, they're doing that with their children. So their children trigger something and they automatically shut it down than just you know, kind of standing back allowing the kids to be themselves and go work on ourselves as parents, right? Um, and the fact that you're able to accomplish that, which, and what I mean by accomplish that is have it so that your children are being completely free and completely themselves with you present um, is a testimony to good parenting, man, but also completely contradicts you calling yourself the worst dad in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the worst dad, I just know uh, I'm glad Kenya's around because she like gets some focus and gets some structure. Because if it was me, I'm just like, do your homework? Yeah, cool. Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> There's I, I no relate. double checking. <laughs> Dude, I, I relate. You know, just I don't. This might I don't know. I'm, I'm just gonna throw it out there anyway. So my little man is on the spectrum, right? And so getting him to communicate is a challenge. And so I. When, when we hang out, he, he's like a little bit of a baby when he's with his mom, but when we hang out, you know, he's a regular dude. And he's quite typical. You'd never really know he was on the spectrum unless you really, really were to engage him. And, you know, he ordered, I, I, I've got him to the point of being able to say, what's up, when he comes into the restaurant, and, you know, like we eat at this breakfast place sometimes, he gets an acai bowl with no honey, no granola, no this, no that. And when he orders it, for me, it's like this huge accomplishment. One day we go into the restaurant and he orders the granola bowl and he orders chicken. And I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. No, 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 no. And I kind of like, no, no, he's just gonna get, you know, the granola bowl. I mean, he's gonna get the acai bowl with, with, with chlorella and that's it. And then today when we were in there, it just made me think to myself like, damn, I should have really just shut up let him go through his entire process, see him order his chicken and his way. Maybe he was hungry on that day, and now I was sitting there curious to know if on the next day he would have just ordered a acai bowl, you know what I mean? And just mm -hmm. maybe gotten the acai bowl with, with, with his chlorella as usual. But I, I you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about the bigger picture. I didn't think, I would have learned something about him, and maybe that morning he was a lot more hungry than, than he was maybe in, you know, previous days. So it, it might, I didn't give him a chance to self-regulate or to prove that he could, and I just kind of regret it. And you are talking about doing the opposite of that. So I just thought I'd throw it out there. Maybe other parents can see themselves in that. Yeah, well, I don't think most parents would know the nutritional value you was trying to put into your son's body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Uh, I probably yeah, wouldn't be like, hey, man, put some more shit on there. <laughs> <laughs> because of his conditioning, because of his conditioning, he, he, he's really got to eat strict, and he's like the healthiest eater in the house, but it shows, man, this kid just walks around glowing, bro. He just glowing. Oh, really? Oh, my God. That, I, I think that, that was one thing I wish we would have done. I'm obviously... Look back now that my kids are both going off to school and everything, which is crazy to think you've known them since they were like, yay, hi. Uh, now they're, you know, they're both graduating high school and stuff. I wish we would have changed the eating habits a lot sooner mm -hmm, yeah. uh, in the house. Yeah. I hope, I hope, listen, I hope my wife watches this podcast and I'm going to splice it up so we can get that sugar rant you had earlier. 
So she gets a real, because <laughs> she's got the sweetest tooth I ever seen in my life. I like to think it's it's because of my dick, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, baby, Yo. I got that sweets for you. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to put some maple syrup on it? Yeah. You need some maple syrup? <laughs> You want to play that? Nice you want to do that uh, Peekaboo by T. Water Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just oh, weird. Shit. Baby, we've been together for 22 years. It's time to get weird. <laughs> what, <laughs> Who's that kid? What, uh, um, so with T. Water Jackson, um, where can people see it this Friday? It's predominantly the digital release. It will be in some theaters. Actually, I can kind of list off what theaters it might be in. You'll be able to see it in the Enzian Theater in Maitland, Florida. You'll be able to see it at the Atlanta Film Festival uh, on the 24th. Uh, you'll be able to see it uh, at, uh, at the Plaza in Atlanta. You'll be able to see it at uh, the Plaza Drive-In in Atlanta. You'll be able to see it at the Charles Theater in Baltimore. You'll be able to see it uh, at the Senator Theater in, in Baltimore. You'll be able to see it at the Esquire Theater in Cincinnati. So, uh, and you'll also be able to see it in Portland and Washington. Outside Anywhere in the Bay? Did, uh, we have nothing in the Bay so far. Damn. You know, it could potentially happen, but people don't really want to show up in theaters like that no more. Yeah. Right? I mean, you got the chance of getting shot up or catching COVID. Like, what, what's wrong with sitting at home? So, right. at home, VOD, iTunes, Apple Store, Google Play, Vudu, Fandango Now, Amazon, all those platforms will be carrying it. Not like Netflix, because Netflix is a subscription deal. Yeah. I'm actually trying to I'm actually trying to be the owner of my content. And so my content is for sale. You can buy or rent my content and I will eventually license it. But the first phase is just like anything else. It comes out in the theaters first. It just so happens during COVID-19, the theaters are is, is more of a digital release. The, 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 the equivalent to a theater release would be theatrical release would be a digital release. So, yeah, yeah you, you know, iTunes, uh, Apple TV, VOD, I'm, I'm repeating myself, never mind. But yeah. Well, look, those, I'm going to I'm gonna make sure I download it Friday with my son. I'm going to tape it so you can see our honest reaction. I'm glad I haven't. I've tried to refrain from watching any clips. I know you've been posting them on the internet, on Instagram and stuff, but I'm not trying to watch them because I, <laughs> I, I just want to see it in its entirety. I don't want any expectations because it's funny, like, I feel like, I've been waiting for this for 10 years. No, you know what? You, yeah, I think it's been that long. And let me tell you something I know about Gary. I know that's a fact. I know what he's saying is really his truth. This brother don't look at other comedians. He don't check out other comedians. He oh, don't I don't. Be I don't watch anybody. Ideas. He don't see nobody. So I know that there's some truth to what that brother's saying. So with that being said, I really just want to know if you and your son sat together genuinely uh, un honestly enjoyed it and where y'all really high-fiving through it and you know you run a little reaction video dude i'd love that i would love yeah. it. in fact I'm, I, I might go online and request everybody to do a reaction video well I, i'm you know what i'm gonna one-up it i'm gonna have all I, I, my neighborhood i live in now up in northern california a lot of white people in the neighborhood middle-aged but they all like that dark shit because we're in the backyard smoking cigars <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed. Am I allowed to smoke cigars, Romney? Is that okay? Yeah, hey man, look. Do, <laughs> hey man, people think that I'm like this. Listen, I'm not Mr. Health. I do, I do everything. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what I think my saving grace is. And I know we're trying not to get too deep. I'm trying to go there with you. It's not my nature. But I'll tell you what I know. I swear to God, nothing has done more harm to my body than cortisol, stress. Stress has fucked me up. Stress has paralyzed me. Stress has aged me. Stress has turned me gray. And so, like, the way I look at it is that I can induce stress in a lot of ways. And sometimes I can induce stress just by eating a lot of the wrong shit. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. And so, to me, the key is, like, portion control. I can't, like, if I see a bunch of food on my plate, you know, my ladies, she, she, she's St. Lucian and Puerto Rican, and the culture, you just pile food on a plate. If I see that, dude, I get nauseated, especially after living in Europe for a while because they eat much smaller portions, spending a lot of time in Japan, same thing, they eat much smaller portions and keep it moving. For me, bro, it's like, don't get me wrong, I want to eat, I just want to eat something quality, I just don't want to eat a whole bunch of it. With the right portions, you can almost do anything, but the key is to not stress yourself out, whether you're putting 
so much sugar in your body that you're getting these insulin spikes that's stressing your cells out or to just be, you know, uh, harboring so much shit that you're constantly stressing yourself out because you're constantly producing all these stress hormones that stop your digestive system and tear you down. I know we ain't supposed to be going here. I'm really trying my best, bro. No, I want it. That's why I was. That's why I wanted you on. I want because really? listen, okay. with podcasts, you got a lot of truckers. You got a lot of people listening to this in their cars, and I okay. want them to steer away from getting off that that fast food joint. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, know what I mean? And, and that's. Yeah, like here, here's a simple practice that a lot of people don't think of. It's, you know, I grew up with a dad who drove trucks. My dad drove taxis and all that shit. Here's a simple thing that you could do. When you get that sandwich, take one side of that bread and throw that shit away. Fact. Or give it to someone who else is hungry. Give it to someone else. Just the bread. Just give it to someone else and just eat half. You're already doing right. yourself a, a good service. And then also understand that sometimes we get addicted. What, what we associate with satiation is sometimes it's overindulgence. So people will eat until they feel stuffed and stuck on Thanksgiving. Some people do that shit every day, right? Yeah. But, but you're, really, you're really compromising your digestive system when you do that. And so the way that I like to think about it is, I like to think of myself as putting things in my body and then giving them time to leave my body before putting more stuff in my body. And one practice that works dope, I love doing this, and I've been doing this forever because I probably like, off and on for like 20 years. And a friend of mine from the Slovak Republic turned me on to it. And she was like, I give my, my, I give my body 15 hours between meals. And I was so like, How many what? hours? 15, she said. And I was like, what? I don't understand. Wait a she goes, is that every her last meal? meal? So what she'll do is she'll wait 15 hours from her last meal before eating again. Okay, got it. So, so those 15 hours, she may have slept for seven of them. I don't know. She, whatever, she gets a window. To, they call it intermittent fasting, but she was talking about this 20 years ago and they wouldn't call it that back then or she didn't call it that back then. And she is the, she is the pillar of health. And so I would just say, you know, if, 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 we can get into the, if we can get into the practice of simply understanding that portion control in itself is going to reduce stress in our bodies, reduce the stress that we put on our liver, reduce the stress we put on our pancreas, reduce the stress we put on our gallbladder, reduce the stress that we put on our colon and our small intestine. If we just understand that alone, we are already ahead of the game. And the other part of it is, especially when you drive in, the drivers, man, let me tell you something. I can't stand having to stop and pee every 30 minutes, but hydration is one of the most magical things you can do for yourself next to exercise, right? And there are times when I'm not doing either enough, and it really shows, I really, really feel it. And so if you're stuffing yourself or you're eating these things that are difficult to digest, and then you're not hydrating yourself, I can promise you that a lot of that midsection ain't even yours. That's just mm -hmm. shit. And it's, that's, yeah. and, and it's, it, it's producing a fatty liver, and it's, and you know, and this visceral fat that's that's occurring right around the midsection, it ain't even yours. If you simply hydrated enough to be able to eliminate shit, you probably wouldn't have. You probably lose an inch or two just in your waist. People be thinking I'm bullshit. And I'm really about to go there now. I know for a fact that there are models out there and celebrities out there that when they got to do the red carpet or when they got to do a shoot, they go get colonics, and they get all that shit flushed out so that mm -hmm. they can lose a little bit of that girth around the waist. And it works too. You, yeah. See, that's why you, you this, this podcast was not about the fans. It wasn't, it was about me. Cause every time <laughs> I talk to you, I'm already going like this. Oh, fuck that sandwich at lunch. I ain't getting no sandwich Dude. at lunch. I mean, Rami, you're the reason I'm gluten free. The way you explained it to me at, at Hugo's cafe on Santa Monica, we was wrapping up big like a man one. And when you was talking about, you put your hand up here, and I'm literally looking at your hand like this. You go, Gary, your intestines have tentacles, and those tentacles move like this. And if you get gluten in your system, your tentacles start to slow down. Pretty soon, they can't process your food. They're stagnant. You want your chemicals be able, you want your tentacles to be able to process that food. I remember looking at the lady go, do you have a gluten-free menu? <laughs> I went cold turkey. I went gluten-free that day. <laughs> and now I've had moments where I've had gluten, obviously, but it has to be worth it. Like, it has yeah. to be something I really want. Dude, you are proactive as hell. I remember you going to get colonics and everything, and I was like, damn, he didn't waste no time. That brother yeah. was like, what is that? What are you doing? A colonic, what is that? I broke it down, you were like, deuces. 
Oh, we, oh yeah, we shot at? Think Like a Man too. Anytime I had an off day, I have my colonic place that I went to. If you tell me to do it, I do it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I know people gonna think this dude is over the top. No, no, no. It ain't like that. It's just that, look, let me explain something about gluten. I want to go back, but there's this huge misconception about celiac disease. I'm not saying that you have to have celiac disease, that everyone has celiac disease or anything like that. I'm just basically saying that when I went to a guy named Dr. Green, he's kind of like one of the leading doctors when it comes to celiac disease, and I got tested and I got a bunch of data that I needed to really understand it. And a few things that I learned was that one, 99% of African Americans don't even suffer from uh, celiac disease. And that's not the question. It's not that. It's just that the fact is that glutinous foods are harder to digest. So they travel through your system slower. It's, just, it's just what it is. And you don't want food moving through your body too fast. You don't want food moving through your body too slow. If it's moving too fast, then the villi in your small and large intestine, these tentacles, are not able to absorb the nutrients that it needs to get out of the food for your well-being. Um, and if it's moving too slow, that stagnance and constipation can actually stress the colon and lead to disease. I'm bringing all this up to just make the point that one of the reasons I try to avoid gluten when I can is simply because of that. I don't like to feel stagnant. And so if I'm going to consume something that I know contains gluten, I'll leave meat out of the picture. I'm not going to combine gluten and meat because meat really takes a minute to, to, to digest, right? And so I have vegan days, I have vegetarian days, and, and then I have days where I will actually eat meat. But if you want to learn anything about what is the best ways to, uh, to, to maintaining decent health, um, look up the Blue Zone people. These articles, these studies that were done on people who are, able, who are able to live 100 plus years healthily, right? And here's the thing, you look in America to say the average life in America is what, 84 years old or whatever it is. 81 years old, maybe, I don't know what it is. But you have to remember here in America, what we are considering life is being dependent on pills, a fistful of pills every day. We're dependent on pharmaceuticals. A lot of us, a lot of our population, what we're calling living is pharmaceuticals and barely being able to, to you know, to be mobile. That's not life. I'm talking, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's always good to be alive, but what I'm actually talking about is uh, living a vibrant, life in your older years, you've got to look into the blue zone people. And it explains blue zone to you, people. They, the blue zone people, you know, they drink, they, uh, they, uh, some of them smoke, some of they eat meat, but uh, they also are very active. Uh, they live in low stress environments. They have a tendency to moderate the meat that they eat so that they might eat meat once or twice a week kind of thing. And so they eat small portions. There's all these different things that go into it. And it's like, a, it's, it's like you're talking about blue zone people who are all over the world, yet they all share this in common. And so I think it's important that, you know, when we talk about this, to not kind of like, we as Americans have this binary way of thinking, this is good and this is bad. If we learned how to honor the nuance, if we learned how to honor, uh, you know, the variables within all of this, all of us would be a hell of a lot healthier. And we probably wouldn't go for a two-party system political, uh, a two-party political system either. Different conversation, I understand, but I'm just right. making the point that this binary way of thinking really hurts us. I gotta cut this out. The problem with the extremes, and I've learned this from personal experience because I am an extreme personality. Uh, the problem with the extremes is that, you know, when you cut things out in the way this cold turkey sometimes and you go hardcore this way or hardcore that way, honestly, it's, it's, it's not sustainable, which is why when we lose weight, we end up finding it right back. It's because what we've done to lose the weight is just simply not sustainable. But if we make these gradual adjustments over time, we can actually get ourselves to a place of balance or at least to a place of where we are, uh, we, we're improving consistently. And so the Blue Zone people have been a great guide, at least for me. Blue zone people. So we can just Google that, right? Yeah. L let me, you know what? I don't want to give you no false information. Let me make sure that I'm talking about the right thing. Blue zone people. Yeah, they call it the blue zone diet. The boy, wait, blue zone, blue zone people, Vegas shows canceled. No, I'm kidding. I'm really kidding. Yeah, it's, 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 blue it's the blue zones. Uh, it's like the five blue zones where people live the longest. Time magazine. Blue zones live longer. It, it, you got bluezones.com. Be careful to not be sold anything. This is just simply an article, that a free article that's online. It's rather extensive. Of course, everyone then tries, you know, all the vultures come out and try to sell you shit 
and, yeah. and use the term blue zone. Just go to Time Magazine and read the Don't damn Don't buy, article. just read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Rami. Well, look, man, I, I appreciate your time today. Again, T. Wanda Jackson, July 31st. It basically streamed everywhere on Earth. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Download. Yo. If you want to watch something, let me say something. I'm giving my my stamp of approval on this, just knowing how this character came to be, how it's inappropriate, but also, if you really listen to what Tijuana is saying, he's speaking a lot of truth. Uh, so that's why I can't wait to see the movie because it's not just like it's not a Porky's. It's not um, a movie where there's no depth to it. It's going to be something that it's so inappropriate, but it's so honest, you know? It, so yes, it, <laughs> that's why I'm looking forward to seeing it. And who doesn't like Regina Hall? Has she done a bad movie? She ain't got one bad performance in her life. And I'm going to say this about this movie, too. Let me tell you something. Here's, here's what uh, Tijuana Jackson Purpose of a Prison has taught me. And Gary, help me out with this. Have you ever been on a project where when you signed up for the project, the script was there 100%? No, never. Dude, same here. I, when I signed up for 40 Year Old Virgin, Judd Apatow looked me in the face and said the script was about 70% there. And I thought I had read a pretty damn good script. And they made so many modifications throughout the filming of it. And it was a pretty damn good script. I'm not kidding. I've always played it safe in my career and kind of waited for things to be ideal and perfect. And, you know, and as a result of that, I've passed on a lot of things and played it very safe. And I've, as a result, I've been in some really good projects. But there were other projects that I could have probably made better had I had the courage to take that gamble. And so with Tijuana Jackson, I didn't know what I was doing the whole way. I had no clue what I was doing the whole way. And in fact, I think it wasn't until like day three or four that I realized that they weren't, that our set wasn't going to shut down and that we were actually going to make a movie. Since then, we've got this, I, I own the movie. There's no big studio behind the movie pushing the movie. There's no big marketing team. Mm. And I've got three different PR companies working on this right now. Seven people, three of which are working pro bono, like President, that they've worked. They've been. They've been deputy. They've been deputy uh, communicators for for, for 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 presidential candidates. Uh, well versed in politics and, and, and marketing, they're just volunteering their time. There are at least, and no exaggeration, there are at least four thousand people who've downloaded the trailer to their own phones and uploaded it somewhere on the internet, just volunteering to be part of the street team. If you want to do that, uh, call me at nine five four two two eight. 8380 and I'll send you everything there is, you know, every, everything that you need for that. There's so much just people helping the the, the 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 Tijuana Jackson fans. It's like I had no clue how any of this was going to come together. Then suddenly I had fans paying for the movie. Then suddenly I had investors wanting to help finance the movie. Then suddenly I had talent involved in the movie that I never thought I could get. And then the next thing you know, we were 18 days into a shoot. The next thing you know, I'm editing a movie. The next thing you know, we're winning shit at festivals. And the next thing you know, we're sitting here talking to you, my dude, about... Uh, I got friggin' Michael Ealy. Speaking of Michael Ealy, I don't know if anybody gives a better backhanded compliment than Michael Ealy. I don't even <laughs> think about this. Michael Ealy, he, you know, he got a, he got a wicked streak, you know that? You, oh, <laughs> that you ain't brother, lying. That brother... He be his sense of humor coming on such the sly, but he did a testimonial for Tijuana Jackson. You will take him seriously, and then when you're done, you'll be like, something about that was off. That yeah. dude gives the best backhanded compliments. Um, the whole Think Like a Man cast, just in case y'all don't know this, we all reach out to each other when we have projects, and we ask one another to help promote it. I haven't yeah. even reached out yet, and folks have been posting my shit, sharing my trailers, making testimonial videos. All I can tell you is we, we met a good group when we did that movie, bro. And I think- I never I think seen I anything like it. I, yeah, me neither. And I think I gravitated to you in the way that I did because of how much we actually have in common in our upbringings, you know? Yeah. I ask this of all my guests. Is there one actor or um, director that you haven't worked with yet that you want to? Or who's, you know, any dream like actor you want to work with? I can't really say that there's an actor or an actress that I would like to work with that I haven't worked with because I, I feel as though when I come together with somebody on screen to do something, we create something new. 
You get what I'm saying? Most of the actors and actresses that I know, I only know through their work. And so when I see them do something, I look at it as if that was a creation based on the chemistry and the culture uh, of that particular set. So it's hard for me to be like, yeah, I wish I could work with this person, I wish I could work with this person, but... Okay, so we'll just, we'll just say Todd Bridges. Let's just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, but there, you know, there, there, there's, just, there's just a lot of dope people out there. I feel like McQueen might be a good dude to work with, you know, because... The director? Yeah, yeah. Ely said the same he, thing, that was Ely's choice. It was Ely's choice, yeah, yeah, I could see Ely saying that. Like, I, I feel like he's got this awareness and sensitivity like the, his his emotional tele intelligence just seems to be heightened. I feel like he would make me see things in a character that I wouldn't be able to find on my own. Oh, yeah. for those of you that are familiar, there's a black director called Steve McQueen. <laughs> just so everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. My bad. I should, Talented I, I should all specify out. that. Twelve Years a Slave, Steve McQueen, um, yeah. would you know would be the director of Twelve Years a Slave, and he just. He, he gets the nuance, he gets the, the variables within, he gets the gray. And um, to me, that, you know, the Tijuana Jackson movie, my character just stays in the gray. He just stays there. He don't never move I can't out of wait. the gray. Right? Look, I'm gonna, Go I'm gonna get a bowl full of chlorella, chlorella and, <laughs> and greens and have no chips, no bread, uh, no sugar, and I'm gonna have the healthiest movie snacks while I watch Tijuana Jackson. I can't watch oh, that and eat gluten and sugar. Are you crazy? <laughs> hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Talk to me really quick. Do you like popcorn? Yeah, I love popcorn. I'm about to send you some popcorn with spirulina on it, and it tastes good as hell. Oh, you know, I had that one time. Uh, LeBron had the smoothie shop down in Miami. So it was really Savannah's, his wife. And they yeah. had popcorn with spirina on it. I, I know I mispronounced that. That shit was so good. So please send me some of that. Oh, I'm about to send you. Oh, you 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 about to get that? This it's a black owned company. This like I'm talking about. This girl might be 17, 18 years old, and she's making. Oh, for this. real? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's it's on its way, bro. It's on its way. Oh, let me know. I'll pump the shit out of that on my podcast. I'll be eating it right now with green shit over my face. And, and, and just, <laughs> just want you to know, it warms my heart every single time somebody tells me that Gary Owen is blacker than me. It, 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 just, <laughs> it is what it is, man. I, I, keep, I, I, keep it, I keep it with me, fam. I keep it. Hey, Every listen, Rami. I listen to everything you say. I'm like, what should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? The minute you say, Gary, you gotta have white pussy, I'll be like, ah, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Romney, I'm married. She's black. I can't eat yeah. that. Nah, yeah, from. Uh, nah, you, sure, you don't understand. Bro? The blue, yeah. the blue world bottle people. That's what they eat to stay young. What? No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> um, nah, dude, for real. I appreciate you, fam. Thanks for you know having a brother on, and you know um, everybody go out there and check out Tijuana Jackson, Purpose Over Prison. Support my boy Gary Owen. There's no yeah. S at the end. There's no S yeah. at the end, fam. I gotta get Tijuana yeah. on here one time. On the podcast, <laughs> uh, at another date, we got to get Tijuana on just for like a ten minute oh. conversation. Yo, let's set that up. All right. Well, look, Rob, right. I love you, man. Uh, all the best to the family. Congrats on the new baby. And uh, I'll when all this is let up, I'll see you. But send me that popcorn. Oh, 100 percent. Give the family my love as well, bro. I'll talk to you later. I will, man. Thanks, Romney. Thank you. Boost. All right. Take Peace. care, man.